Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Tracy Granzik, Executive Director at the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety Center for Healthcare Narratives. I'm co-host of tonight's virtual town hall event, examining the power of stories and narratives to address bias in healthcare. Behind the scenes are my co-host, Armando Nahum, Executive Director, Center for Engaging Patients as Partners, and nursing faculty, Jeannie DeCosmo, Senior Director of Clinical Care Transformation at MedStar Health. We are pleased to introduce an incredibly talented panel of speakers, physicians and researchers from the MedStar Health ecosystem. You will soon meet Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan, Dr. B.G. Thomas, and Dr. Delia Wesley. Also joining us tonight to illustrate bias through their personal stories, our two talented writers and healthcare professionals, Dr. Brenda Arthur and Felissa DeRose. A few housekeeping items. Tonight's event offers one and a half CE credits for physicians and nurses. The learning objectives for tonight's event are listed on screen. And our ultimate goal is to elevate the dialogue around bias in healthcare without judgment so that we can become better aware of its impact on patients and providers as people as well as the immediate need to address and mitigate bias in productive, empathetic, and compassionate ways. To ensure you receive continuing education credits, please take note of the information on the slide and email me at tgrands24 at gmail.com if you have any questions. And with that, we're off. Stories have long been used to make sense of the world, to entertain, to inform, to warn of danger, and to alter behavior. Stories can slide past our resistance. Jonathan Gottsall, who wrote The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human, is a distinguished fellow in the English department at Washington and Jefferson College. His research is at the intersection of science and art, and he has been published in numerous places, including Scientific American, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Nature, and NPR. His work reveals that psychologists have studied how stories affect the mind. Results show good stories in classic story structure can infect minds with ideas, attitudes that spread. Stories can slide past our resistance. In fact, fiction is more effective at changing beliefs than persuasive arguments and evidence. There is in fact a growing body of formal and informal research examining the ways in which narrative can transport us can instill empathy and change behavior. Medical humanities and narrative medicine are growing academic disciplines as a result, furthering the foundation of knowledge and proof of concept that stories and narratives are far more than they may seem at face value. Whether it be because the cat is out of the bag that humans can be, can be manipulated at worst, changed for the better in best cases by stories, Industries from consumer goods to the media and even healthcare have picked up on the power of narrative to deliver their messages. Stories and narratives related to health and wellness and bias come in all forms and from all sources. We get to know the characters and the narrators, the protagonists in these well-drawn stories. We grow to love them. We learn something new. We live vicariously through their victories. Our hearts break with their losses. Most of all, we empathize. And while we can't live these exact experiences, we can put ourselves in the shoes of these characters, if only for 90 minutes in a theater. Well-told stories, however, stay with us. They push at long-held beliefs. They nag at our subconscious. We become uncomfortable, feel as though something has changed within, as though the world will never be the same again. Writers, screenwriters, songwriters, especially speech writers, they understand exactly what tugs at our heartstrings. They know that humans are wired for story. Think about the stories and narratives that have changed you across a lifetime as you listen to the speakers today. Good authors and artists study and understand human nature. They are steadfast in their self-inquiry and they work to uncover their own biases. Reading, both fiction and creative nonfiction, is key to understanding ourselves and others. Our world expands or shrinks in proportion to the amount of time we spend working to understand the experiences of others, especially those not from our circle of family and friends. David Eulen, a prolific reader and professor of creative writing at University of Southern California, 
and former LA Times book critic wrote, we tell ourselves a story, then we dream our way inside it as a way of bringing it to life. It's why we have to be careful about the narratives we evoke or create because they are bound or they bind the limits of what we can imagine, the limits of our ability to think. Yulin goes on to say, when we read, we soul travel in the sense that we join or enter the consciousness of another human. We empathize, we have to, because our experience is enlarged. Maxine Hong Kingston published The Woman Warrior in 1977. But when you study with the LA Times book critic, he pulls the best of the best from a reading list that remains timeless. Kingston's book is a mix of memoir and myth, defying genre rules, and revolves around her relationship with her mother, a doctor, as well as what it means to be a Chinese American woman. She is a skillful storyteller and provides a first class lesson in how, to, in how a master puts words on a page. She writes, night after night, my mother would talk story until we fell asleep. I couldn't tell where the stories left off and the dreams began. Her voice, the voice of heroines in my sleep. She shares her experience with readers and the takeaway is a deeper understanding of what Chinese women are up against from the moment they are born. But narratives and empathy are only the beginning. From this place of connection and concern, we need meaningful action, programs, and progress to address the long-held biases causing the health inequities, the poor outcomes, and resulting mistrust of the healthcare system in communities of color. Mama Might Be Better Up Dead by Lori K. Abraham was published in 1993. It's an in-depth, well-researched account documenting the contributing factors to the inequities in care on Chicago's West Side, as told through the Baines family's story. Profiteering in dialysis treatments, egregiously low thresholds for Medicare, Medicaid dollars, few, if any, physicians of color treating and building trust within the community are just some of the truths called to light. Abraham is accurate in her reporting. But who acted on the knowledge that in poor Black neighborhoods on the west side of Chicago, well over half of the population dies before age of 65, compared to one quarter of the residents in middle class white Chicago neighborhoods? In Alex Kotlowitz's national bestseller, There Are No Children Here, published in 1991 and named one of the top 150 most important books of the 20th century by the New York Public Library, the author follows and befriends two young boys growing up in the violent Henry Horner homes on Chicago's West Side. He documents their experience and tells their story in their words and the words of the community. Of note is the willingness of the boys to admit, I'm just tired, but unable to express their sadness or their anger until it turns to rage. Throughout, the author reveals that the community is unable to get the help they need for a variety of social determinants of health related reasons. For Kotlowitz's follow-up book, An American Summer, Love and Death in Chicago, published in 2019, he returned to the same community, though he had really never left it. And he documented where many of the same people from There Are No Children here were now. Research and interviews for the book left him depressed, unable to write for six months as he experienced vicarious trauma, hearing and witnessing more of what the community was going through in 2019. Yet the book itself is filled with hope because of the people like Kriena and Milan quoted on the slide, whose stories we get to know. I had the honor of interviewing Kotlowitz for the summer issue of Please See Me in 2019. We talked about many things, including the power of storytelling. He said, I guess the ultimate question is, how can you get more people to pick up a book like An American Summer if they don't have a connection to these communities? That for me is the real challenge as a storyteller, as a writer. How do you engage people who wouldn't ordinarily be drawn to this subject matter or these individuals? My answer to that with There Are No Children Here is that I wrote about children. This book was a harder one. You hope that the stories are compelling enough, that they'll draw readers in, and that once they've met the individuals in the book and have heard their stories, that it will have upended what they thought they knew. As the program continues, please listen to our storytellers and speakers alike with an open, empathetic heart and mind. Try to put yourself in their shoes. I am now honored to introduce a rising star in healthcare who I met after she submitted a creative nonfiction piece entitled Exhaustion to Please See Me's 2020 winter issue entitled Bias. Brenda Arthur, MD, 
is a rising PGY-1 emergency medicine resident at Temple University starting in July. And if she is representative of what we have for the future of healthcare, we are in the best of hands. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. Today, I'm going to be reading excerpts from an essay I wrote describing my experiences with COVID and the murder of George Floyd and just in general being the daughter of a Black man in this country and kind of what that meant to me. At the time last May when I wrote this, it was therapeutic in a weird way just because I was struggling with a lot of sadness and anger. Yeah, I hope that as a young physician, I can encourage people to question inequities and just things that seem wrong in our country and hopefully encourage us to share conversations and better the lives and health outcomes of minority patients in this country. My father was diagnosed with COVID-19 sometime in March, a few days before New Jersey pulled me and all other third year medical students from the hospitals. He is a physician, so I was not surprised when I heard the news that he had a fever. The frantic calls for my mother began a few days after he tested positive. He's not getting out of bed, he won't shower, he hasn't eaten, he's not talking to anyone at the house. This continued on for weeks while I was completing my third year clerkships online two hours away. It was strange to see my father over FaceTime when he was sick. At baseline, he rarely called or answered the phone unless you absolutely needed him. But when you could get a hold of him, it was a celebration, and he always knew what to say to make everyone smile. A few of my friends who were lucky enough to meet him in passing thought he was a serious man. At home, though, he was goofy, always dancing or clowning around, and he had this hysterical laugh that you could hear if the windows were open from all the way down the block. Now, with his bearded face pressed sideways into his pillow, he would barely speak, let alone smile or laugh. This FaceTime view of my father presented a shell of who he was, and it was terrifying. I remember one day he told me to, that the next time that I called him, that I should be prepared to take note of all his phone numbers and accounts and passwords. I was his oldest child, and this was going to be my responsibility. We were nearing the end. May 27th, 2020. Last night, I read the news about George Floyd, an unarmed black man who cried out that he could not breathe prior to his violent death. Another unarmed black man. Trayvon Martin, Ahmaud Arbery, Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, Jordan Davis, Emmett Till. The list goes on and on. I'm devastated, I'm furious, and I am exhausted. My father is a man of color, so is my baby brother. This feeling, the pit inside my stomach and throat, is different from the concerns I have about COVID-19. It is fear is stronger, tearing at my insides, making it hard for me to catch my breath. I don't know if I should scream or cry. May 29th, 2020. A few days have passed, and I feel like I can think again. My father, thankfully, has recovered from COVID and is back on the front lines. I want to be there with him, and as a rising fourth-year medical student, I am so close. My feelings in general about my father being a physician in America are complex and difficult to express. He is a man who has dedicated over 20 years to serving pediatric patients in New York City, not only as their primary care physician, but also as a pediatric emergency medicine physician. Two full-time essential jobs. I'm convinced he never sleeps. My dad truly is a superhero, and he has learned to gracefully deflect the micro and macro aggressions that come with being Black in this country. As his daughter, I have not yet mastered this skill, and am especially unsettled when I witness how others in the world interact with him. The slights are sometimes subtle. Looks of surprise when it's made known that he's a physician. Sometimes less subtle. Like a Honda salesman blatantly asking if my father can afford the price of their cars. Or a flight attendant directing him to the back of the basic economy line without bothering to look at his plane ticket. Sometimes they are as aggressive as an officer pulling us over just to ask if my father is driving his own vehicle. I recognize that nobody will ever see my father as I do. Few have the privilege of knowing his journey to this country or his deep love for family or passion for medicine. He is not perfect, and I'm sure my entire family would love to see him much more often. But my dad has somehow managed to dedicate absurd hours to patient care and still make it to my white coat ceremony. He is a superhuman, and still I question if his life is valued in America. We are in the midst of a pandemic. Death from coronavirus is rampant, and we have had major disruptions to our normal way of life. 
This is not an excuse, however, to neglect the pre-existing epidemic that has overwhelmed this country for years. This epidemic, injustice and violence towards Black men and women in the United States is unlike any virus. It's not something that a human body can naturally fight off alone or simply recover from with time. We cannot ignore it, we cannot deny it, we cannot forget the value of a human life. Our black brothers and sisters constantly live in fear that they will not make it to tomorrow, and it is not because of COVID-19. My emotions on this subject course deep through my body. At age 25, what am I to do with all of this rage? Where can I put all these feelings? I implore you to question the racial injustice that continues to occur in this country. Please hear our cries. If you're fortunate enough to have the choice on whether this will affect you today, choose to let it. Try to feel how this obvious and disproportionate violence affects your Black family, friends, brothers, sisters, neighbors, patients, and colleagues, not just when there's a jarring act of violence in the news, but every single day. I am exhausted, and this is just too much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. I look forward to your next publication. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan, who will be speaking on the history of bias in medicine. Lakshmi is at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital leading the Medical Humanities Initiative. As you listen to her talk, think of Brenda and her father's experience over the course of her lifetime. Consider how the past impacted the overall well being of both Brenda and her dad. How can we make sure no little girl has to witness her superhero dad be dismissed like he was? Thank you so much, Tracy, for having me and for the invitation. And hi again, everybody. I'm Lakshmi Krishnan. I'm an internist and historian of medicine at Georgetown, where I'm also the director of the Program for Medical Humanities. And I also want to thank Brenda for that incredible story. Brenda's experience in 2020 and throughout her life are at the heart of what I'll discuss current experiences and outcomes that are a result of a long history of medical racism, structural inequality, and bias. We can't understand these factors and shape health equity and produce informed bias mitigation without delving deeply into our history. Furthermore, what is history but a retelling through a critical lens of narratives and stories, but also of data and of gaps? So in our time together, I want to focus on some of the historical roots of medical racism, inequality, and bias. Of course, there's a long history here, but given that these issues have emerged even more starkly during our own pandemic, COVID-19, I'll spend a little time on a particular case study, one of our last great pandemics, the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919, which is often misleadingly called Spanish influenza. Here is an outline of where we will go. Of course, as I said, there is a long history here, and so this is a survey, but I certainly invite you to continue the conversation with all of us. But first, through a few examples, I want to orient us to the history of racism in medicine in the US and some of the ways in which the medical establishment has been complicit rather than separate from it. You may remember this headline, which was news in the days pre-COVID 2018. This statue used to be in Central Park. It's of J. Marion Sims, who's lauded as the father of modern gynecology. The Sims forceps and the speculum are named for him, and many of his gynecologic discoveries were made through repeated surgeries performed on enslaved women, in numerous instances without anesthesia, even once ether became available. Three of these women, we know their names, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. Sims trained in Pennsylvania, but returned home to the South where he became what was common in the 19th century, a plantation physician. These were lucrative positions. I wanna show this, it's a very important image in the history of medicine. We can observe so many details here. That is J. Marion Sims positioned at the beginning of a procedure with Anarka. Lucy and Betsy are peering around the sheet. But I want to call our attention to how sterilized this image is. The pain and the horror of the surgeries is papered over in a scene that looks almost domestic and pleasant. The person responsible for unveiling the history and ethics of what Sims did and for the removal of the Sims statue in part is Harriet Washington, ethicist, medical journalist, who's known for many books, but primarily for medical art apartheid, which is a classic in the field, and I highly recommend it. But what Sims did was not particularly exceptional for his time. 
it's easy to dismiss him as a monster, but in, fa in fact, he was part of a longstanding system calculated to succeed. In the decades before the Civil War, the number of physicians increased more rapidly in the South than the North of the US. The ratio of physicians to persons was higher in slave versus non-slave holding jurisdictions as doctors followed the source of income. Again, the system enabled this and medicine was part of both the system of enslavement, but then post-Civil War had a continuing role in perpetuating both individual and structural bias and disparities. Here we have another example of a form of medical experimentation, dissection, which was happening at our academic medical institutions very commonly, as we see here in the South Carolina Medical College Prospectus, which actually lures students in by the prospect of having the opportunity for dissection primarily drawn from the Black population locally. This legacy goes on. The standards that were applied to other patients were not applied to the poor, the working class, the immigrant, and the Black American population. Henrietta Lacks, who was treated at Johns Hopkins in the 20th century and whose cervical cancer cells were harvested without her consent, going on to generate the HeLa cell line, which many of you may have heard of, which as many of us learned in medical school and in our scientific training, has been responsible at the hands of talented scientists for a number of life-saving medical discoveries and developments. So how do we use this knowledge toward improving our healthcare system, toward mitigating bias and reducing health disparities? Furthermore, as this great conceptual framework from the National Equity Project shows, any exploration of bias must be situated as part of a larger conversation about how current inequities in our institutions came to be, how they're held in place, and what our role is in perpetuating inequities despite our good intentions. Outlining here the scope of the problem when we think about health inequity in general, I'm quoting here from Dr. Lisa Cooper and Dr. David Williams' JAMA article, which is a tour de force in outlining the current problem while tying it to a history of systemic racism and structural inequality. And I think this last line is of a special importance that the number of excess deaths in the last decade of the 20th century for Black Americans was almost as high as in the first decade. This is the kind of sentence that makes us as historians wonder what is there in our toolbox that we can use to help us understand not only that specific moment, but how we got to where we are and why things haven't changed as much as they should have. 1918 influenza thus is an important case study for us as we think about the way that these issues operate in our own pandemic and the way the pandemic has landed on minoritized communities. I do want to point out a caveat that though history certainly offers lessons and we should think through them, we also should be careful to not draw over generalizations without acknowledging how specific circumstances are. For example, 1918 influenza was a different experience for Black Americans in Baltimore versus Native Alaskans in the Brevig Mission. And we know that this is actually one of the key principles of bias mitigation, avoiding stereotypes, avoiding overgeneralizations, focusing on the individual and variable. So the 1918 influenza was an outbreak that claimed the lives of as many as one in a hundred of the world's population at the time. An estimated one third of the global population were infected and the disease was exceptionally severe. We think that total deaths were estimated somewhere between 50 to 100 million, but also it's generally accepted that recorded statistics are likely to be a significant understatement. Focusing in now on the differential impacts of the pandemic on minoritized communities, my own work has focused on the Black community. Non-white populations had an all-cause mortality rate that was approximately 35% higher than that of white populations immediately before and during the pandemic. But something odd happened during this particular influenza outbreak. Black Americans actually had lower morbidity and mortality than the white population during the fall of 1918, which was particularly devastating. But they had higher case fatality than their white counterparts, meaning that if a Black American contracted influenza, they were more likely to die. There are a number of theories some of which I describe with my colleagues in an Annals of Internal Medicine article on this topic, including that this may have had something to do with Black Americans' early exposure to the first milder wave of influenza, which conferred immunity. And then second, ironically, that segregation may have actually functioned as a kind of quarantine protecting Black communities from white communities. 
but what appeared to be a milder impact on the black community, which is not entirely true, as I said, often actually led to new bias or entrenchment of existing bias, as we see in the statement by the Chicago Commissioner of Public Health, John Dill Robertson, who used this to justify poor public health measures, especially, especially in minority parts of Chicago and draconian housing ordinances leading to overcrowding. What we then see in response are the enormous efforts of the Black community to reverse such miscommunication. Respected periodicals such as the Afro-American, the Chicago Defender, carefully documented influenza's effect with church registers, personal columns, and town updates listing the many community members who had the flu, mourning others, shaming those who were not taking it seriously. Major African-American columnist William Pickens wrote on this subject talking about how bias cuts both ways and was convenient for white Americans in this case. So when the 1918 influenza pandemic began, Black Americans were already beset by social, medical, and public health problems, including all of the ones that I've mentioned, and limited access to healthcare and a lack of Black health professionals. When they access care, Black Americans receive substandard care in segregated hospitals if they were admitted at all, and only a small number of Black hospitals existed at the time, including Freedman's Hospital in our own city, now Howard University Hospital in D.C. So many Black Americans were being treated in their homes by family members and midwives, and difficult living conditions driven by poverty, racism, and discrimination also make caring for loved ones who are sick with influenza very challenging and avoiding the spread of infection very challenging. Something else happened just before the pandemic that had a severe impact on the Black community and its health status. From the late 19th century onward, seven historically Black medical schools existed. But after the Flechner Report of 1910, which is hailed and praised as having reformed medical education, this report actually had a disproportionate impact on Black medical schools. And part of that was because Abraham Flexner believed, and I'm quoting, African-American physicians should be trained in hygiene rather than surgery and should primarily serve as sanitarians whose purpose was to protect whites from common diseases rather than physicians themselves. So what we see as the result of that is after 1923, only two remained, Howard and Meharry Medical Schools, which are still around today. But this really had a powerful downstream effect on Black health professional training. The irony too was what a huge role Black health professionals played in the pandemic. Black nurses, pictured here on the right, excluded from World War I service, nevertheless served on the influenza front lines and were called, a term familiar to us, essential workers who were at a premium. I just wanna take note here, when I learned history in college and graduate school, I saw very few images of non-white minoritized health professionals. I saw very few images of Black American health professionals. And of course, as I made this my research focus, I learned that these sources existed, these photos existed, and that this was a significant oversight. So uh, the images that we use, what we show our students and our trainees are so powerful as well. And you can imagine how this continues to have downstream effects when you're exposed to those images frequently. Black professionals took great pride in their role fighting influenza. I have here a very moving a quote by Dr. John P. Turner, where he's talking about the role of the Black physician in fighting influenza, but how that role might never be recorded by history. I'm here to undo some of that. This influenza pandemic is an illuminating case study for understanding the role of pandemics in the history of bias, health disparities, and the broader health equity movement. For Black Americans, surviving and fighting this pandemic was a cause for communal effort and activism and a source of community resilience. But at the same time, because of minimal national mobilization to improve the health of communities of color, it also compounded mounting distrust in the U.S. government to intervene and help improve the health of its non-white citizens, a wariness that we have seen replayed in the COVID-19 pandemic. So having looked closely at that st case study, I'm going to close with us thinking about our own moment. Over the past year and a half, the COVID-19 pandemic has turned a magnifying lens upon our individual biases and structural inequalities playing out on the level of lives and communities and countries across the globe, 
the vulnerable are suffering disproportionately due to systemic issues that pre-existed the pandemic. For example, what is happening in India and Brazil now. We know these numbers. In the US, Black people account for 21% of COVID-19 deaths where race is known. In August 2020, the Navajo Nation had lost more to coronavirus than 13 states combined. We also see disparities in the vaccine rollout. Unfortunately, the healthcare landscape in this country has often been a catalog of failures of differential treatment, often rooted in racism and bias and income inequality. Stories and history are so important to help us understand how we got to where we are. Narratives reveal the individual experiences, the interior of people's lives, and history gives us a framework. It doesn't provide all the answers, but it tells us, as historian of medicine Keith Whalu once said, where we are in the plot. And that can help us. It can help us anticipate our failings, our mistakes, the possibilities, and also the places of joy. I'll end with this, this wonderful proverb, don't let the lion tell the giraffe's story. Who tells our stories, our histories? Whose voices are memorialized? Whose experiences? Thank you so much, Tracy, for inviting me and for this wonderful opportunity. I'm so glad to share this work. Thank you, Lakshmi. Lots to think about for all of us. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Felissa DeRose, who is a diabetes lifestyle blogger and literature scholar who enjoys writing about the intersection of health, Black women, and literature. She began blogging at diagnosednotdefeated.com in 2011, and a year later founded Black Diabetic Information. She was a Fulbright Scholar to the United Arab Emirates, has given keynotes and presentations about living with diabetes in five countries, authored a collection of poetry, essays, book chapters, and her forthcoming project highlights the representation of African Americans with diabetes in television and film. She's going to read The Daily News Blues, a fictional piece she submitted and published in Please See Me in our last issue, Mental Health. She discusses the fears her character faces when looking at the disparate outcomes for a Black woman with diabetes seeking care in the time of COVID. The Daily News Blues by Felissa DeRose. When her eyes opened, she stretched her right arm across her full bosom toward the midnight blue nightstand in search of her insulin pump, but it was not there. She pulled gently on the tubing until the device appeared from under the pillow. She gave the power button one short press and 117 lit on the display in green. Her fasting blood sugar was within range. I made it through the night, she thought to herself. Thank God. This silent praise had become her morning ritual after beginning a new insulin pump weeks ago. Switching delivery methods or insulins always caused her to experience hypoglycemia too frequently, which produced fear-based insomnia. She sat up, put on her eyeglasses, and surveyed the room. She tossed the floral comforter to the side and removed the plantar fasciitis boots from her feet before getting out of bed. She did not need to wear them anymore, but after receiving a denial of coverage letter from her insurance company and paying $300.26 each, she decided to wear them nightly until she grew tired of them. She considered it as a way of getting her money's worth. She eased off the mattress, turned the light on, and entered the bathroom. She believed in the law of attraction. She looked in the mirror and said, Today, I am going to leave the house. Today, I am going to leave the house and go. She paused, puzzled, realizing that she didn't know where to go. She thought about going to the local pharmacy since customers never linger inside. However, her prescription started being delivered back in March when the first COVID-19 pandemic lockdown began. The mall was out of the question because her anxiety rose just from the thought. Suddenly, she remembered an appointment with her primary care physician. Since the pandemic spread, her doctor gave patients 30-minute time blocks to meet either in person or through video conference. She had always chosen Zoom. However, it was December, and she yearned to embrace the world a little. 
Fully dressed now, she wore black yoga pants for comfort and a long sleeve yellow t-shirt to brighten her mood. She hunted for a tube of lipstick, forgetting that eyebrows and eyeshadows were the current trends, two things she could never make beautiful. If she left the house now, she would be too early, but if she didn't move with the courageous momentum swaddling her, she would never go. She put on a pair of black loafers, found an N95 mask, and then grabbed the doorknob to leave. When she unlatched the lock and opened the front door, she froze. She looked at her right hand gripping the doorknob and should have seen the need to lotion the thin layer of ashy skin between her thumb and index finger, but instead she saw her umber brown hand and remembered a news article that she read last night. Pulse oximeters less effective on blacks. She wondered if the melanin in her fingertips would negatively affect her ability to enter the doctor's office upon her arrival. She then doubted her decision to leave the house. She recalled the article linked to another headline, risk of death four times greater for people with diabetes. She closed the front door. She recalled a black bus driver who posted a video on social media demanding for social distancing after being coughed on. He died days later from COVID-19. She wondered if the doctor's office was safe. As she returned the latch and locked the door, she reminisced about the details of a black woman physician in the hospital with the coronavirus pleading for anti-racist treatment because her care team denied requests for pain meds. The physician died in agony. She stepped away from the door and removed her jacket and shoes. She decided that she couldn't leave the house, not today. She sat on the sofa and turned on the television. U.S. hospitals running out of ICU beds after Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, the newscaster said. She heard the words while reading the scrolling headlines at the bottom of the screen. Half of hospitals in black and brown communities have no ICU beds, she sighed. She closed her eyes, sensing the walls thicken around her like the boots she wore at night. She felt the sorrow, fear, helplessness surge. Tears trickled past her cheeks in slow motion. She inhaled deeply, putting into practice the skills obtained from a weekly black meditation group she joined after George Floyd's murder. Then she screamed, will there be an ICU bed for me? Will doctors believe my pain? She continued to summon every thought that resided in her mind and soul. She should have stopped after the stress of liberating unconscious torment caused her blood sugar to rise and her insulin pump alarm to blare. But she couldn't. The two cried out in jarring unison, louder and louder, like a siren. Thank you, Calissa. Your piece leads nicely into MedStar Georgetown University Hospital's Dr. B.G. Thomas, who will be speaking on how implicit bias plays out in healthcare. By day, Dr. Thomas is a transplant nephrologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and a passionate supporter of improving healthcare overall. Thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. Thank you for everyone joining us today. I'm going to talk a little bit about implicit bias, and it goes along with Dr. DeRosa's story that expressing concern that our health out, healthcare outcomes are impacted by implicit bias. So let's define and talk about implicit bias to get some basics in the understanding of what implicit bias is. Bias by itself is not a bad thing. It's just a predisposition. What do you like, what you don't like? For instance, in this uh, figure, there are different colors. My favorite color is red. Yours might be blue, it might be green. Whatever it is, there's nothing bad or wrong about, bad about it. It's just that that's what you prefer. And that's what bias is. It is something that you prefer or you do not prefer. And that's what you're, how you're expressing it. So when talking about implicit bias, let's define it a little bit more. We talked about the word bias, but what about implicit? Well, implicit is when the bias is unconscious. You don't really realize it's happening, but your brain is triggering it and it's going on. It's causing you to make certain decisions, but you're not really consciously thinking about it, much like the part of the iceberg below the water versus explicit when it's right out there in front of you. So if you look on the slide, there's a small example there under explicit bias. A sign on the window of the apartment says, we don't rent to so-and-so, you know, a race, a, you know, a certain sexual orientation, whatever it may be. That's very explicit. Implicit bias, on the other hand, 
is when you know you might look into someone's background more based on their race based on something like that you're not really overtly um, showing anything but it is it's there and that's an unconscious bias and there are some more examples there on the bottom that you can see so how does how does this come to us how does it affect us well close your eyes for a second imagine a physician and a nurse interacting at the bedside of a patient then the physician heads home says bye to their administrative assistant and as they get home they get out of the taxi that that they, they uh, hired to take them home, and they say hi to the new couple that moved in next door. Now, what I would want you to think about is what race, what gender, what type of couple did you see? Who was it that was there that popped into your head when you thought of these people? And that is your own implicit bias. What kind of person is a physician in your mind, or a nurse in your mind, or a taxi cab driver, et cetera, et cetera? So where does unconscious or implicit bias come from? How does this develop with all of us? I love these two quotes from Dr. Gupta and Dr. Vanish, you know, uh, briefly summarize them. Dr. Gupta said, the bias is an algorithm of the mind, a complex set of emotions that have become attached to one another and manifest the way we perceive, reason, and remember certain things and make decisions. I love Dr. Banerjee's, implicit bias is a thumbprint of the culture on us, how it is expressed. The social circles you have, what your experiences are, that is how implicit bias develops. And there are many different kinds of biases. You know, and you can see here there's a, there's a wide list from language, sexual orientation, to ethnic background, to weight, to having a disability, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to discuss biases in medicine now more specifically. There are many stakeholders when it comes to implicit bias in healthcare, from the patients to the clinical staff. Anybody that walks into the clinic, into the hospital setting, is a stakeholder in this. So is there data that show that there's implicit bias that affects healthcare professionals? Yes, there is. And you can see here a very uh, a list of them, you know, with various studies such as medical students' implicit bias actually remains constant or increases over the time of their training. Um, black patients are thought to, are perceived to have less pain um, and sometimes receive less pain medications. Uh, patients with similar cardiac risk factors, there could be a gender bias as well as other studies from there could be a racial bias as well. Um, maternal and child health care outcomes are affected by implicit bias as well. Um, you know, so how, the, how someone might get prenatal advice that can be affected by the race or uh, socioeconomic status of where you are. And another really critical part is we need to realize what we write in our medical, um, in the medical records. If a patient is the word non-compliant to you, that can be very bad for a patient in the future. Um, and so you have to be very careful of using that type of language. Uh, because they can affect their health care and their outcome. Um, and this happens uh, many times in the health record, unfortunately. And there are other very unco- uh, un- implicit and very le- ways that uh, bias comes out in healthcare training. For instance, the kidney function, there is a factor there that, that race matters when you affect the, when you calculate kidney function. And there's a lot of controversy today if that, that should be removed or should remain. When we look at certain devices, you know, in the, la- in the last year with pulse oximetry, that can be affected by the tone of your skin, but that and that can be calculated in your. Um, it's taken into calculation of that, of the pulse ox, or my, you know, and that can affect what the oxygen saturation reads. You know, for dermatology, depending on your skin tone, some signs might be seen, some signs might not be seen, and we don't. We have not done such a great job of educating our medical students on these. So, how does um, healthcare professionals? Ha- develop this implicit stress? How does it affect us on a day-to-day basis? How to, because prejudice, as you see the quote, prejudice is a great time saver. You can form opinions without having to get the facts. And you can see here, basically it's a stressful day, you need to make quick decisions. And sometimes that's when implicit bias can creep in and affect your decision-making. So you want to be more active in your thinking. You know, so you can see it's increased by stress, time pressures, multitasking, et cetera, et cetera. And it does not mean that you yourself have bad intentions. It's just, it affects how you think and how you move forward with your decision-making. So what is the cost of implicit bias in healthcare? Well, of course, it affects patients as well as healthcare providers. It can alienate people. It can cause increased disparities. Um, the workforce might not be as diverse. Um, it can affect providers in the sense of burnout, higher rates of depression, anxiety. And of course, there's even a financial cost to implicit bias with unnecessary testing or you know potential complications and such things. So how do we how do we attack implicit bias? And one thing that I have to mention is no matter how much implicit bias or unconscious bias training you get, you have to have an open mind and a growth mindset. And the first step is really recognizing your bias. 
but this is not a silver bullet. It's just one tool to help reduce implicit bias. So how can we solve this problem? As I mentioned, one of the first things is to recognize your biases, and there are different ways to do that. There is different tests you can take, but really, that's the one key take home point I would say is recognizing that you might have a bias is the first step in order to battle it. You can, there are certain strategies you can do, thinking more broadly, um, identify with your patients, consider the opposite opinion of what you have. For instance, I mentioned the, the term compliance. Look for any factors that might show the patient is actually a very good patient and, and be an advocate for them, as well as taking the perspective of the patient. So I'll leave you with this. Even the most well-intentioned person unwittingly allows unconscious thoughts and feelings to influence apparently objective decisions. So it's very important to understand you might be biased in a situation and to make sure you think about that. Take a second, pause, and think about if that is affecting your judgment. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad everyone came today and I hope we all take something away from, from this event. And it doesn't end today. Remember tomorrow and the next day and the next week, we're all still learning. We're all still growing and hopefully together. And again, thanks to Tracy for putting this together and all my other colleagues for a great um, event and a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. So much to think about and a, a wonderful framework to understand implicit bias. Thank you, BG. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Delia Wesley, Senior Director, Health Equity Research at the MedStar Health Research Institute. Her talk, Engaging Patients from Our Communities to Mitigate Bias in Healthcare, addresses the importance of understanding the lived experience of our patient communities here at MedStar Health. So all of what we've heard and what we're discussing directly impacts the health outcomes of particularly members of the most at-risk groups and at-risk communities. Those are from minoritized groups, and it's so critically important that the voices we hear are representative of every member of that community, of those communities. Because as we've heard, the system wasn't created with every voice in mind, and it certainly wasn't created with diverse experiences in mind. So let's think through a few more with, with a few reflections from patients interviewed by a dear colleague of mine. And just in an attempt to understand again and underscore the importance of presenting an alternative lens and exposing people's experiences and context and reality. Let's think about Rosina. Rosina is a patient of ours who lives in a food desert. And this is her grocery store. It's convenient and the food, most of which it is unhealthy, is actually affordable. Also note it's a liquor store. Rosina shares, my doctor tells me to eat healthy, but it's hard. The grocery store is far away. The foods I, act, I can actually get are not healthy, but at least I can afford them. Think about how understanding this voice shapes her interaction with providers and the health system. And then there's Daryl, who sees nothing in his clinical environment that reflects his racial or cultural identity. Daryl says, I don't connect with anything in my doctor's office, not the magazines, not the pamphlets, or the team that cares for me. Nobody looks like me. Think about how this impacts his interactions with his care team, with the healthcare system, and ultimately how this impacts his health outcomes. And then there's Amira, who gets the impression that her doctors don't think she's very bright because English is not her primary language. Amira says, I'm Muslim. English is my second language. I feel like they think I'm not very smart when I go to the doctor. Again, think about how this impacts Amira's interactions, the care decisions she makes or that are made for her, and ultimately how this impacts her health outcomes. How do we ensure we involve voices from everyone in our communities to break down these structures, to challenge the role of institutions in creating and perpetuating bias at the institutional level? How can these patient narratives help to mitigate bias? Think for a moment about entering a healthcare setting, whether it's your hospital or a clinic, this is a picture from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, a fairly large hospital in Boston, but likely very similar to the walls of many of our academic institutions and large care settings. In this case, the employees and students who regularly gather in this amphitheater include women, Black, Hispanic, all ethnicities, and the 31 gold-framed portraits of medical luminaries that cover the walls do not reflect any of these experiences. The portraits, first of all, are all of men, and 30 of them are white, maybe one is Chinese, and what has been infamously referred to as the dude wall is really present in a lot of our healthcare institutions. And, and, and it sends a very clear message every day. What kind of message are we sending with these types of oil pot portraits, these dusty old photographs that line our care institutions? At Yale School of Medicine, for example, one main building's hallway featured 55 portraits, three of them women and 52 men, men and all of them white. 
And so in an effort to really modify their structural environment and to be more inclusive, they removed these portraits. So what can we learn, again, from community voices to impact structures like this, the ones that we've seen? But first consider the question, how frequently does the physical environment actually reflect the reality of our community? While every organization really needs to assess its environment for inclusivity, it's extremely important for our institutions to actually reflect the, the community, to ensure that they don't perpetuate bias in just the physical environment alone, that everything reflected reflects the, the lived experience and the lives of our patient populations, and not just the privileged few, and not just the, heter the homogenous few. And only then can we expect to break down the walls, build trust, and create a sense of community. Only then can we achieve true patient engagement and understanding that, that the medical community is really a microcosm that, of the world, right? Filled with injustices and bombarding us consistently and constantly with messages around what's good, what's bad, what's pretty, what's ugly, what's kind, what's evil. And while our spe as, as our speakers have noted, each of us come to work each day, most of our providers come to work each day in, in these institutions to to care for others, striving to do the right thing and treating everybody fair, biases creep in at all levels and lead us to make decisions that oftentimes we're not proud of and oftentimes that are harmful. So research shows very clearly that when patients are engaged in their healthcare, and these are things that we know are true, it can lead to measurable improvements in safety and in quality. We know that patients engaged in, engaged in their care um, receive more efficient care and overall that this improves population health. And the idea of having patients, their families, being considered as part of the medical team and not as visitors or, or, or not part of the team, it's, it's more practical and more helpful and actually results in more, much better pa patient care and patient satisfaction. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The concept of patient and family advisory council. So a patient advisory council, also known as a patient advisory board or a patient and family advisor, advisory council, is a representative group of patients, community members, caregivers, who meet regularly with clinic staff to help improve the performance of our clinics or our hospitals or our care settings. These patient and family advisory councils play a critical, critical role in helping hospitals to become more patient and family centered. And, they meet regularly as a forum for patients and families to partner with hospital staff and leaders to shape decisions and influence change. Patients are able to share their unique experience, to tell their stories, to tell their stories, share their narratives, and use their informed perspectives to advise on issues and decisions that are made in these, clear set, in these care settings. And so you can see how this is a potentially really incredibly powerful tool if you consider some of the voices that we've heard today. And so patient engagement as a really key tool to mitigate institutional bias ensures that agenda setting is in the interest of patients, their families, the larger community. It enables us to identify and implement ways of improving the care experience for all patients, to identify ways of improving the care experience, focusing on listening to and respecting the perspectives of others, enabling others to see beyond their own experiences and outside of their own lens. There are a few core concepts of patient and family-centered care that are really important to understanding how this can be a powerful tool in mitigating bias. The first is the concept of dignity and respect. So patient and family perspectives and the choices of these patients and families are heard, and most honest, most importantly, that they're honored. The patient and the family, their knowledge, their values, their beliefs, their cultural backgrounds are all taken into consideration for care planning, for decision-making. The second is communication and inf information. Again, at the core of patient and family-centered care, healthcare providers are, sh should be able to share complete and unbiased information with patients and their families in a way that's clear, in a way that's complete, in a way that's accurate and timely uh, in helping patients and families effectively participate in the care and in decision-making. Participation is, is another core pillar, a core concept where patients and families are actually encouraged and supported in, in participating in the care and in decision-making at the level that they choose and are comfortable at. And then finally, this core concept of collaboration where patients, families, again, and healthcare providers collaborate in policy development, program development, in education and research and evaluation in every core concept of care. And so why does diversity actually matter in patient and family engagement? Again, it exposes a wider range of views, a wider range of views that we don't understand unless we hear the stories, unless we hear the narratives, unless we hear about the experience. 
and then prevents against bias along the lines of key domains such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, age, financial and socioeconomic status, physical and mental ability, education, level of schooling, all of these that are representative in the patient voice and all that bring new voices, new views, new narratives that shape how care is delivered. Such a core powerful tool. And so in this, in this aspect, we can hear community voices, bringing in the critical narrative and the lived experience that's often not reflected in the boards of the hospitals or the groups of the key decision makers, that, put, that patient voice matters, that community voice matters. And so it's really important also to look at what happens when we fail to hear these voices and these perspectives. The importance of bringing in patient and family voices, their narratives, and learning from their experiences was unfortunate, real, unfortunately laid bare at the, it, towards the end of 2020, um, a case of racist medical abuse, which persists in contemporary times. This past December, an uh, in Indiana resident, Dr. Suzanne Moore, who died after her case of COVID-19, was not taken seriously by her care team, by white physicians within the hospital system. The story caught national attention and the attention of media outlets only after Moore posted her personal testimony to social media. And even then, it was too late. This is what happens when we don't hear the voices. This is what happens when we don't listen. And so we don't even know we're failing our patients. Patient and family advisory councils are an avenue to enable hospitals to listen, to connect to the community, to ensure we include the voices that matter. Without it, we don't understand or even know that we're failing our patients, even if we're not actively, especially if we're not working to actively understand. And until recently, it's only until recently we've actually been collecting the type of pertinent data that provides undeni undeniable data points for what the communities are experiencing and what, what is going on within our, our community networks. And for only then, only through this data are we able to understand what's, what's actually going on. And had we had this, we could have understood this long ago because it's been the same things that we just haven't had the avenue to listen to. And so through our patient and family advisory councils, we really, again, get the voices of community. And if those voices do not include every community member, we don't even know what's going on. So it, ensuring engagement and retention of these voices is critical. And how we do this, because a lot of these councils, unfortunately, are, are unable to retain some of our most valuable voices. And so it's really critical for us to look to community leaders for referrals, visualize what the community actually looks like. And this is a key point where data matters. And again, we've only recently started being able to collect and visualize these data. Looking at critical ways to represent the physical structures and environments, for instance, looking around our walls, engaging local artists in the development of patient-facing materials, education, looking at our hospital artwork, murals, um, patient education, and really ensuring the language and culture of the community is represented in all of our forward-facing materials. And then engaging with local communities at local events to spread the word and attract members as a way to ensure we're retaining the community voice. So bringing it full circle, hearing the patient voice, seeing care through their eyes is what needs to be at the core of healthcare. It's critical to ensuring we can change behavior and change our systems, providing care to mitigate the impact of bias, particularly for our, those that are most at risk. Acknowledging addressing the history presented earlier, uh, medical racism and how bias shows up is an integral part of the discussions surrounding mistrust within our community. And this quote here exemplifies it nicely. And again, why it matters to hear the voices of today. And the quote says, we remember the past, but we don't live in the past. It's historical for us. It makes us vigilant, but it doesn't make us stupid. So we remember the past, but we don't live there. There's hope that this can be curved by having as many conversations, many forums, discussions, hearing as many narratives as possible. And also not just dismissing concerns, but addressing them, letting people know that there's a long dark history with this and it's, it's real in the community and that these voices matter. And then lastly, I end with this quote and sentiment, that healthcare institutions and academic institutions often put the onus on the community to trust them. And this has been the case for in the past and it still is very much the case today. And it's through approaches that we've presented, through patient and fa family advisory councils, through narratives, through personal stories that we've presented today and incorporating and valuing those stories and those voices is the key way for our institutions to really shift that change. And thank you for the opportunity to share today. Thank you, Delia so important to include our communities and their stories in everything that we do in healthcare. 
I want to end by thanking our talented speakers and storytellers and say how honored I am to be a part of this group. We've heard two heartfelt stories of lived experiences facing bias and the micro and macro aggressions in the healthcare environment and in the world. We listened to Dr. Krishnan talk about how we arrived here in the history of bias. We heard Dr. Thomas speak about the consequences and the form of poor health outcomes because of the bias suffered by communities of color. And we heard Dr. Wesley speak about how our patient communities can be the very source of our solutions at addressing bias in the healthcare workplace. And finally, I hope all of you can see the power of these stories and narratives to open a dialogue around bias that at long last provides an empathetic meeting ground so that the real work can begin in earnest. Before we leave for our live Q&A, I wanna leave all of us with words from Dr. Michelle Harper, an emergency medicine physician whose breakout memoir, The Beauty and Breaking, examining her road into medicine, the health inequities she witnesses in the healthcare workplace, along with the racism and sexism embedded within the medical culture, made the virtual rounds during the pandemic. A skillful writer, she uses patient stories to shine a light on these bigger issues throughout the book. I had the pleasure of interviewing her for Please See Me's bias issue in the winter of 2020. In chapter five, entitled Dominic, Body of Evidence, midway through the book, Harper writes, what we had just experienced had offered an opportunity for all of us to recognize that America bears not just scars, but many layers of racial wounds, both chronic and acute. In order to move beyond them, we need to look at them for what they are, diagnose them, treat them, heal them, and then take care not to pick at the scabs, reopening old wounds and creating new ones. We need to stand face to face with it, to look and feel and smell and taste what we do so we can choose exactly how we want to be in this world. Here's to choosing how we all want to be in this world. Let's move now to our live discussion. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and I, I really have to say that I'm just in awe of this panel. I have watched the presentation come together over the last few weeks, and I just, it has been a wonderful group uh, to work with. So I am hoping that there'll be lots of questions for them. I especially want to thank our guest storytellers and speakers, um, Dr. Felissa DeRose and Dr. Brenda Arthur, as of this week. Congratulations to her. Um, we helped her celebrate on Monday and appreciate her taking the, the time to be with us. I want to ask them both why it was important for them to share their stories, not only in Please See Me, but with our group here today. Felicity, do you want to start? First, I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of today's presentation. I've just thoroughly enjoyed it. My cup is running over um, today. So it was important for me to share my story. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes, the first person in my family. And when I said that to one of my physicians, the response was, you know, people don't always tell you the truth in your family, that you know, someone in your family has diabetes if you have it. And um, you know, so that was the first thing. I was told that my family is lying. Um, and I was diagnosed at the age of 31 years old. I was told then that I had type two diabetes even though I went into DKA. By the time I was in the emergency room, my blood sugar uh, was 597, something like that. I, I, I was in a wheelchair, I couldn't stand any longer. For eight years, I lived with that diagnosis. And I went into DK, uh, DKA again in 2019 at a diabetes conference. <laughs> and I had been asking my endocrinologist for type one antibody testing. And I was denied antibody testing for an entire year. I even sought a second opinion and I was still denied. 
And part of that denial, I believe, is because I am an African-American woman living with obesity. And it was my gynecologist, someone completely out of the field, who did the antibody testing for me. And I have type 1 diabetes. I was never, um, I was never tested properly when I was diagnosed. And so part of me telling my story is, one, I believe that our assumptions about what a person looks like with type 1 diabetes, thin and white, has a negative effect on other populations. And so my plight now um, involves getting people to even know about antibody testing. I had a relative, uh, a distant relative who probably had type one diabetes, but was told he was a bad diabetic and ended up dying from complications of diabetes at an early age. So the, the bias that people have, it affects people's real lives. And so as a person um, living with a chronic condition, I feel it's important to share my story as a researcher of um, health humanities. I also find it important to talk to both communities the people and the academics. Well, we're grateful that you took the time out to join us today. I mean, the, again, the narratives really carry these, these larger, um, the data points and the, you know, all the information that was shared throughout the presentation. So thank you. Um, and I think, you know, we've got Chris Goschel with us tonight. Um, what you're talking about is like a cognitive bias in addition to just the bias period that leads to diagnostic error. Um, and the poor health outcomes, which BG touched on. I, Chris, do you want to comment on that? I wrote that down. I had sent Felissa a, a, a private email in the chat a few minutes ago, but when she did that, I went, ah, another diagnostic error, and I will be in touch because we're looking very specifically um, at diagnostic errors and all of the issues that contribute to them. And thank you so much for sharing your story because. Um, bias is an area that we haven't even begun to touch on in the way that we should. So I will likely be reaching out to you after this. Um, but thank you so, so much for sharing that story. Um, there, there are unfortunately many more people like you. I'm absolutely sure of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris, for weighing in. I'm, I'm glad you could make it tonight. Yeah. Um, Brenda, do you want to share why it was important for you to be here this evening? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. That was really wonderful to listen to the whole thing through. Um, I think I have, I have so many answers to that question. I think the main two, I guess, being a Black pre-professional student and pre-med student and then being a Black medical student and now a young physician, you you kind of are affected by bias, I feel like, in a lot of aspects of your life and you think it's normal. Um, and for me, going through medical school, I was just kind of searching for that support and comfort of, of other people who look like me, which you don't get as much in, in a professional kind of setting, as, at least at my institution. Um, I think more importantly, going to medical school in Camden, New Jersey, um, Camden has a large minority population of patients and residents, um, and the physician population in our hospital is not necessarily reflective of that. So a lot of times it is the Black or other minority students at the institution who are kind of striving to have these conversations and, and discussions and educate um, about our unconscious biases. So I think it's, it's a very weird dynamic, and I for myself, it's just important to, I guess, keep discussing it and keep trying to make my own voice heard, make other people who look like me, their voices heard, and ultimately take better care of, of all of our patients, so. Yeah, thank you so much. I When your story came in um, during, it was really during COVID, um, when everything first happened, it was one of the ones that just blew me away. And it was a pleasure to work with you on that piece and to get to know you, and I'm so excited for you to start your career. Um, I think I, I meant what I said. If you know you are a representative of the future of healthcare, I feel really good about old age. <laughs> I didn't prior to, you know, I was unsure, but now I'm, I'm feeling better. So thank you so much.
Any, I'm going to open it up now. Does anybody have any any pressing um, questions or comments or a, a story of bias um, themselves that they'd like to share? Uh, Tracy, I just want to answer the question in the chat. I think about if you have more education, are you look less likely to have implicit bias or uh, any bias, I guess. Um, um, that I know of, there's no study per se that shows that. Teachers in higher education, there is been has been shown to have implicit bias. You know, with um, you know, for instance, black students are tend to be punished more than other students of other races in the classroom. Um, so there is that there, but I would say diversity in the workforce is the main thing. So that if you have more diversity in your workforce, in your hiring committee, there's less likely to be bias there. So if you that that's really what I would think of. So in medical school, you know, there um, now it's more diverse than it was five years ago, ten years ten years ago. But there's still a long way to go, and that's what I think the best way to answer that question for me. I'll open it up to the panel or anybody else that wants to say anything. But I think that a key thing is it's not necessarily higher education, and many of us did not have formal bias training throughout our training actually. But it's also the diversity of of that uh, facility or that school. I just want to jump jump on that. Thank you, PJ, because I I had a strong I had a strong response to that wonderful question, because I was I was really thinking about it. First, I thought, is there data? And I thought, well, BG will know the answer to that. But then, as a historian, I I thought about all of the highly educated physicians, health professionals, all of the people that I study, right, the 19th century, the early 20th century, and how. They clearly were prejudiced and biased and racist. Um, and some of that is systemic and some of that is contextual, but my answer would be the right kind of education. Yeah. Um, you know, when I like when I think about when I came up in medical training and all of the sort of biases that were perpetuated at my institution. Um, and now I see this kind of sea change happening in medical education, and I'm so, so delighted. Um, because I do think there is a real movement to undo, um, you know, bias in higher education. And so unfortunately, education can be sort of a tool of perpetuating bias. But, um, you know, that's why I point out in my talk, the thing about images, like seeing images of black health professionals, seeing images from World War One, seeing images from 1918 influenza, and how what we say to our trainees and our learners is so important. So anyway, a kind of long follow up to that. But um, I think education can reverse bias if we if we do it right and you know are offering sort of the diverse perspectives that BG was mentioning. Actually, BJ, this is Marty. I asked the question and I felt vaguely elitist even asking the question or even framing it because I went to a liberal arts college that you know my parents had enough money to help me get to. But for me, it was exposure to people that were different than me and exposure to different issues than I'd ever thought about before. One of them being history which is why I was so impressed by your presentation lecture because I just you know, had a real grounding in how history is written by those who you know, have privilege in their societies. And that's what we think of as the facts going forward. And that's just true across the board. But it did, when I was in college, which was the middle seventies, the big issue was apartheid. And just, I would never have thought about that if I hadn't gone to, to that kind of school. I wouldn't have been exposed to it if I hadn't met people of color who it was really important to. So I, I just, that's why I, I asked it. And then the other question I've got, since I'm not gonna take the floor other than this, but as I was listening to your presentation, I, I'm sure I have implicit bias just because of where I'm from and how I think, but I don't know whether I, I, I struggle with whether the big issue for me at this point in time should be working on my implicit bias or getting out in the streets and fighting overt bias. I mean, it just shocks me that there's as much, you know, explicit um, um, bias, prejudice, racism in this country still after all we've learned. I mean, I'm really thinking about the immigration issue right now and just the way that's talked about in, you know, circles in which I, I move, relatives of mine think it's, you know, it's okay to be prejudiced against people. And, you know, my family is only two generations away from being immigrants ourselves. I have a grandfather who was an immigrant. So it just makes no sense to me that that kind of overt racism and overt bias is still out there. 
Um, anyway, I just throw that out as a comment and it's very troublesome to me right now as I, I sit in sort of my nine by 12 home office in downtown Chicago where there's a 30 year difference in life expectancy depending on which neighborhood you live in. All right, Marty, can I tag onto your question just for a minute? Because I'm sitting here and cogitating on, and I don't think anyone spoke to this, but as um, a white haired um, lady who's been in healthcare for a long, long time. Um, I am a voracious reader. I'm also a researcher. I'm reading everything I can and talking to people, but I need coaching on how to ask for help when I'm sticking my foot in my mouth and don't realize it. No. Or when, when my implicit bias is glaring to people that I care about, but I don't know it because I don't see it. And, and and I haven't found a lot that has helped me that way. And I'm wondering as we, you don't have to answer that now, but if we have time, I would love to hear someone speak to that. So how do I ask uh, of my friends to speak up, to point it out? Um, how, do, how can they be comfortable? I mean, I, I don't know what to do with that. I'm just always like, eh, you know, I wanna do better, put it that way. Chris, and, and to Marty's point, you know, I just want to jump in to highlight that it's part of the human condition, right? It's every single one of us, whether we come from, you know, who knows whereville, you know, small town, wherever, or, you know, downtown Washington, D.C., as I am, I, it's part of the human condition, and it, it's, it, it has nothing to do with sort of your race, ethnicity, your background, your gender. It's part of it being human, and I think to, to Marty's original question, it's, um, there actually is one study, and I only know this for the moment because it was in a paper one of our students brought to, in today, um, which, said, which said that when surveyed, health, the, using the implicit association test, healthcare workers, um, their implicit biases pretty much mirrored that of the general population. And so speaking to the fact that it's actually probably got very little to do with, with education. I think to Lakshmi's point, you having education maybe puts you in a position where you're better able to address it and be self-aware and, and, and attempt to work on it, but it is something that affects every single one of us. And I think that's the critical piece here is being aware that every single one of us are subject to it, nobody's immune to it. Um, and that's the key, I think, take home in, in beginning to address it because there is, I think, a tendency for some folks to be like, well, that doesn't affect me. And I think that's where the problem begins. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why programs like this are so important because it opens up a dialogue. And you know, in BG slide, it said, good intentions doesn't take away implicit bias. Um, and Chris, to your point, you know, we all, you know what you know because you grew up in a neighborhood that you grew up in and you don't know what you don't know. And unless you have friends from all different places, they will school you very quickly in, in ways of different groups, you know? Um, so I think that's why this is so important to bring everyone together. We have two hands up and another um, question in the chat. So Earl's iPhone, um, I see you. I see your hands up. If you can. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, my video is off, but anyway, yeah. Um, uh, as a uh, number one, thank I'd like to thank everybody for this great panel. Uh, some great, a lot of insight. One of the things I'm realizing, I'm actually an academic in a highly selective, um, competitive surgical specialty, and one of the things I'm noticing is that our black students score lower on the step exams, therefore making them non-competitive and it always breaks my heart every year this year included to see our black students who want to get into these competitive specialties uh, but they scored too low say on step one so my real issue is what i'm starting to realize is that black students learn differently and they score lower because i just think back to my own i, I grew up in the inner city of detroit my own education how we learn differently and so we test differently and I don't know, no, really tangentially, I guess uh, was mentioned about the bias in education, but to me, the bias in the test, and I know at, in colleges and, and you know SAT and things like that, that's been addressed, but nobody's really talked about bias in this higher education in the, um, the MCATs or, or even um, the, uh, the step exams. I don't know if any of the panelists have any insight, especially uh, say our medical, I mean, our, 
a rising uh, intern uh, who just graduated from, uh, I guess, going to Temple. But anyway, if anybody has any insight, I'd really like to hear, because I'm starting to formulate this thing about the bias in how to account for it as we pick our residents. Anyway, thanks. Thanks, Earl. Does anybody on the panel want to want to field that question? I can start to answer. I don't. I don't know that I have a, a great answer to that, but I know um, at least in medical education, they're trying to get rid of that bias by making step one pass fail starting, I believe, next year. Um, and I know, at least for me, going through residency interviews this year, a lot of programs advertise that they look at your application with a holistic review. So instead of just filtering you by your board scores, they look at your whole application and see, okay, maybe you didn't do that great on your boards, but you have all these other extra things that will make you a wonderful doctor. And that's how they're trying to recruit and make the residency class kind of more diverse um, in that way. Yeah, that's helpful. I, had anybody else heard that the step test was gonna be pass fail? No, I'm gonna say, yeah, 2022, it goes pass fail. Step one goes pass fail, yes. So uh, with education, it's really from when you're a child and who you grew up with and everything like that, because you have to think of who's making the test and who's writing the test. If there's not a lot of diversity in the test makers, that could lead to bias cre creeping in into a test, right? You know, it might not be as objective as we think, you know, particularly if it's, if they're, if it's English or something else that's not so scientific as, you know, one plus one equals two, if there's room there to move those things, particularly with certain critical thinking aspects of those tests, it can have bias creep in. So, you know, so your whole schooling throughout your life has led you to that point. And if you didn't attend certain places or certain groups, you, if you're the out group per se, you might not recognize certain cues, which might lead to a poor test score because you just never been exposed to that, that type of question before or scenario. Thanks, BG. There's a really active discussion going on in the chat too. So um, please take a look at it. Um, if you get a chance. I'm going to go to Carol Hemelgarn, who has a question. Carol? All right, so I'm going to state that I hope I'm not putting my foot in my mouth <laughs> up front. All across the country right now, everyone's trying to increase diversity on their boards and workforce and all that. Um, I sit on a couple boards and everyone is talking about how do we make sure it looks representative of everyone. How do we do that without it being tokenism? How do we how do we reach out to people and they're you know of all races, gender, LGBT, everybody, without people feeling like oh you're picking me for this reason? Um, so any guidance suggestion I would appreciate. All right, who's going to field that one? <laughs> That's a great. I have some ideas on that. Yeah, great question, Carol. Hi, this is Christy Graves. I have some ideas on that question. Go ahead, Christy. Um, so I think, I think, um, hi everyone, sorry. <laughs> these things are, I get very passionate about these topics. Um, the idea of uh, doing a number of, of reviews of the, where the position advertised, uh, the makeup, so where the positions are advertised, the makeup of the selection committee, the processes and ways in which people are evaluated for a fit uh, for those positions, um, ensuring that the selection and review has training related to understanding implicit bias, um, going through what what the values are and how those are reflected in the ways in which people are selected. Um, and then striving for, you know, personal diversity, diversity in thought and being very purposeful about it. Um, uh, those are a few ideas, but important question. Thanks, Christy. I, you also had put a question in the chat um, about what ideas do our speakers and event organizers have for how we can enhance diversity and representation among leaders of our institutions. Um, so along those lines, you, you were looking for solutions as well. And then also, um, how can we mobilize the resources needed to support the work for raising awareness about implicit bias and the processes of how to center voices from people of all backgrounds? Um, those are the tools, you know, that I think BG, you kind of touched on um, Julia, you touched on too with the with the um, um, PFACs, 
Would either of you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, so absolutely the PFACs. I think what's critical about the PFACs is it's um, bringing the voices into the leadership structure. And we know that these things don't work if there's not buy-in at the top. And I think what's really beautiful about the PFACs model is that it is bringing the voices up into that top level where the decisions are made. So that's, um, I'll stop there. Uh, Brian Buckley just put a tool in the chat, um, tool on governance, APHA. Oh yeah, sure. Um... So I know for the American Public Health Association, where I do a lot of work, we actually, uh, each year, we actually have like, it's a 30% threshold for the executive board. And this also can apply to other governance structures. And every two years, it's re-looked at and seeing if we should make it higher and looking at the data to see the representation of the community that they serve and what those numbers should be. And so that was a very intentional thing that they did around board governance to Carol's point, there's an intentionality. So it's not just like the one person, but really a spectrum of folks. Um, and that is also highlighted in the actual process of thinking about who the new board members are. And for many boards, they usually have it at a tiered rate. So it's like a whole new set of board members might come in that do have that full spectrum for diversity. I just want to interject, actually, it's kind of looping back to things that Dr. Graves said that Carol asked. One thing quickly I will say, first of all, just the fact that you're mentioning tokenism and showing awareness of that is huge, frankly. But secondly, I will say, having been the beneficiary of mentorship from people like Dr. Graves, when you hire those candidates, when you bring those folks in, supporting them, acknowledging that their experience will not be the same um, as their counterparts and and putting the you know putting the tools in place like to me that feels like anti-tokenism that feels like we are really supporting your work and however you want to thrive in this workplace um, so I think that's huge otherwise it's just you've hired somebody and then they're just kind of swimming out there alone and often sinking yeah, and that's, Beth, do you want to comment? Because that's kind of what you said in the chat, something along. Yeah, I mean, so I on this one, I, I struggle. I had two conversations. I mostly do board consulting for a living and, and board governance work. And I had two conversations with health systems today who have worked really hard to diversify their boards, but the, then they feel like the people they brought on only want to talk about health equity and none of other issues. So they're struggling because the, you know, everybody with COVID is about to go bankrupt. And so, you know, we've got these boards saying we, we can't spend 80% of the board meeting only talking about health equity. We have to find, you know, it it's a, it's a huge issue, but how do we balance it with our cash flow? So I, I do think that's, I, I don't know the right answer. And I I do think that's one issue that contributes to Carol's question about tokenism, because if you go in and you only talk about your priority issue and not the breadth of other issues that are your fiduciary responsibility, it contributes, I think, to the feeling of tokenism by the other board members, as opposed to if you're prepared to go in to talk about the full breadth of issues and understand that that breadth of issues are your responsibility. So I do think it's not just um, recruiting the diversity of candidates, but it's training them to be prepared to talk about uh, the breadth of board responsibilities. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that I had said earlier is that empathy and compassion is where we kind of begin, you know, we come together there and then we have to branch out and figure out how do we listen to each other and, and solve the bigger issues. Um, but that could be a mentorship issue. Like, so, so yeah. those people should be any new board member should not just talk about what they know and are comfortable about. If you're the lawyer, you're going to be comfortable talking about risk and legal. If you're the banker, you're going to want to talk about the balance sheet. You know, if your you, most of your experience is, you know, on health equity as a, you know, college professor, you're not going to be as comfortable talking about the balance sheet. So, you know, how do we kind of bring people into other zones so they're more comfortable talking about that? That's, just one of the, I spent a lot of time talking about that today. So, so it's very timely. I, I think one other thing, Beth, if I could, that I think ties in with that is I have several friends who um, came to boards as I will say tokenism. They have become sophisticated board members and they are in high demand. But as they try to suggest colleagues or friends or others who could be mentored up to serve on boards, 
um, it feels as though that they are, people want them because they're tried and true. And so how do you even broaden the, I'll say the base of community members who are available, willing, and organizations that will invest in, again, helping people feel comfortable with areas that are not their historic um, areas of expertise. I don't know if you have insights on that, but I have several friends who are like, I don't want to be the token. You know, I know I'm a good board member. I can't be on one more board. I have a full-time job. Uh, totally. I totally think that's a huge issue. But I, this is where I think we have to have some sort of certification slash mentorship program where you say, if you put this person on your board, we're going to train them for a year before they join your board and they're going to be ready to hit the ground and they'll be one of your top board members or something like that. But you have to do that in coordination with either state hospital associations or, you know, some you know, safety net hospital associations, that, that there's got to be a way to, to create a, a push and a pull with, with a high confidence factor. Yeah, this definitely seems like a topic that could, that could be, serve a whole nother program. I want to make sure that we're getting everybody's questions in and being respectful of time because we're now at um, six o'clock central. So depending on where you are, it's later or earlier. Um, Eileen Moore had her hand up. Eileen, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thanks, Tracy. I just wanted to take this opportunity to point out and remind the group that as we talk about mentorship, I think we unfortunately sometimes squeeze it in a small box. And I think that an individual human being uh, benefits from having multiple mentors. So as we we're speaking about readiness to be on a board, different issues, et cetera, I think that if we can sort of open the aperture a bit and say, this person that we're trying to really help be ready to move into this situation uh, deserves and gets input from content experts, if you will, in all these different arenas. And thus we have yet another community the person's part of, because I think that sense of belonging is just about equally important as the uh, background information uh, knowledge that goes into performing one of these jobs well. So just my uh, two cents worth there, thanks. Thank you. All right, did I miss anybody else in the chat with a question? Anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Any, any, any Anything else from our panel? Is it happy hour? I have one question, Tracy, which is how do we amplify, like we heard some really great voices here. How do you amplify the voices? Cause like the, whatever it is, 30 some people on this call, you know, I feel like we should have 5,000 people on the call. And, and that's, I think, one of the challenges is just to amplify on, you know, perspectives right now. I love that question, Beth. I, I mean, I'm constantly trying to figure out how can we elevate, how can we elevate, you know, the great stories that are in Please See Me. I mean, we looked for stories to come out of our own PFACs and we couldn't find them in, in the time frame that we had. And over the last three years, you know, Please See Me has gathered some wonderful storytellers, some wonderful narratives about health experiences that, you know, I would have never known about, you know. Um, and that, again, is a small platform, you know. Um, so I'm going to put that back to everybody on this call, um, the panel especially. You guys are young and good with social media, better than you surpassed my skill set a long time ago. Um, how do we do it? You know, how do we how do we get the message out? Get more programs like this into the mainstream? I think this is a fabulous start. I again, I'm just in. You know, this was such a pleasure to work with this panel. So I think let's figure it out. I mean, anybody have a great idea that they want to share right now, or, or is it too late? We need to take MIQS and replicate it in every single healthcare institution as a start. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like it. We do have our fearless leader on board too. Dave Mayer's here. Um, I'm sure he's happy to hear that. And Marty, Marty Hatley is here too. Uh, Tracy, um, I just um, would like to extend my apologies for, I take full responsibility for the tiny glitch in the beginning where you were cut off. Uh, we, we found out that if I unmute, if I mute myself, nobody hears the sound. So um, we discover that. No problem. We rolled with it, Armando. You're the best. We couldn't have done this without you. You, you. you did a great job. All right. Well, I am going to, as much as I want to hang out with y'all and continue this conversation, I think it's time to, to call it. Um, we, we need to save the chat, Armando. 
Sure. Because um, there is some fabulous information in there. Please email me if you want CE credit. I want to make sure that we have a, a roster um, of people that I can turn into Cytel and make sure that you all get the credit for, for attending. Thank you everybody for your great comments, thoughtful comments, and for being willing to make time for this important topic. Have a great night.